I am the math librarian at Texas A&M. Um, and so uh, I was asked by the libraries to come and do a little bit on uh, cartography during the war. This is not my area of research, but I did get to do research for this, and it was really interesting, and I learned a lot, and so I'm just gonna kind of share that with you today. Um, the majority of this presentation is going to be images of maps, because I think when we're talking about maps, we should really be looking at them. Um, so this next slide is going to be the only text-heavy slide in the presentation. And this is a quote from a book that was actually about uh, mapping during the war. And I think some of the most important parts, it's talking about how in um, all sides entered the war, they entered with small scale topographic maps. So this just gave them a broad overview of what they were looking at. And it ended up not being good when we got into trench warfare because they needed to be able to see that direct location they were in and where they were going to be firing at. So as the war went on, they kind of started impromptu survey teams that began creating these maps for the war. And then by the end of the war, this last little bit of the quote I really like, Britain printed 34 million maps during the war, France 30 million, and Germany 775 million maps. Um, so then what this did afterwards is gave us a great archive of maps um, around the world for researching and looking at the war. Um, so to start, I want to talk a little bit about the advancements that made uh, in technology during this time period and what that did for cartography. And of course, one of the large advancements that took place was flight. Um, so the Wright brothers had their historic flight in 1903, which led to the first planes being used in warfare in 1911 by the Italians. Um, and so what you got out of flight was then you could do aerial photography. Um, so a couple of these images here, the one at the top, is a gentleman in a plane with um, a camera capturing aerial photography. The one below that are three soldiers with a variety of different cameras that would have been used during the war. And then to the left of that, um, is uh, three gentlemen who are doing photo, actually there's four, doing photo mosaicing, which is where they have taken these images that were captured and overlaying them to create a map. Um, and so all of this had to be done using uh, control points. So they would take the maps they had already established prior to the aerial photography and find these locations that were unlikely to change. So it's things like churches and schools and government buildings. And then when they would fly and capture these images, they would use those control points to line up their aerial photography to their drawn maps. Um, and what this let them do with this photography was they could update their maps daily, sometimes multiple times throughout the day as um, the war was shifting um, and control of land changed. Um, when they would capture these aerial photographs, they had desired overlaps for their imagery. So when they were going down a single flight line, so starting at point A with an end of the flight at point B, they would try to get a 60% overlap between the images. Um, and then when they would do their next flight over C to D, they would try to do a 30% overlap of that first flight line. And they would do this as they did a whole survey of an area. This would allow them to do that photo mosaicing and overlap to make sure they got complete coverage, but would also let them um, take two images that were captured adjacent to each other and look at them through a stereoscope to get that 3D imagery to look at um, the terrain and buildings. And this gave them a really great uh, look at after areas were bombed and the changes that happened. Um, and these images I all pulled from American, Im uh, American Memory, which is from the Library of Congress. It's a wonderful resource for accessing um, this sort of material for free online. Another important part during the war was the projections that the different countries were choosing to use in creating their maps. Um, and so when you are, basically, simplest uh, explanation for a projection is when you're taking the curved surface of the Earth and um, drawing that on a flat surface. A lot of times the analogy that is used is when you peel an orange um, in a one whole single piece that's still giving you this curved surface and if you try to entirely flatten it, you're gonna break that orange peel. So we can't completely map Earth flat without having some form of a distortion. And so that distortion then is going to cause, um, especially if you're doing artillery, some issues. So this one here, the Bonnet projection, which was used by the British and the German in creating their maps, gives you a central meridian that is a straight line, which is causing this heart-like effect on the map. Um, and so what this does is it's producing um, a map where the scale is true along that central meridian um, and you have no distortion there and it preserves your area of measure. This was not good for artillery though. Um, and what it meant that they had to do when taking their shots was they would have to gather an additional measurement on the field and then from that do um, some math to, make, to decide where they needed to actually aim their artillery. The French were using the Lambert projection um, and so this one um, preserves bearings. And so what it meant for artillery is they actually did not have to do that additional equation work when they were on the battlefield. They could just make a shot to the point that they were given. Um, and that was really important because it preserved um, that kind of element of surprise when firing. So you would get maps 
like this. Um, and this is a gunner's grid. Um, and this is actually in France, and this map is dated to November 10th of 1918. Um, and so using these grids, um, they could take map shooting. So if they were shooting without this sort of grid work, they were taking what they were calling ranging shots, which they'd basically lobby a couple shots from their artillery at the enemy, see where they landed. When they got lucky and hit the spot they wanted to hit, then they'd keep taking more shots. When they were able to move to doing map shooting, which was based on the aerial photographs and then converted into this grid system for the artillery firemen, um, they would actually know directly where they were firing at. They didn't have to be able to see the location at all, and they can make that hit first. So it can kept an element of surprise for them um, and let them um, kind of have that larger casualty rate. And so there's a quote from George Mackenzie Franks, who was a British general in the Royal Artillery. And he actually called the development of being able to do map shooting based on aerial photography work as one of the wonders of the war. Um, and it's kind of an interesting quote because artillery actually accounts for 60% of casualties during World War I. Next slide, please. So going on to talking a little bit about the battle lines and mapping of these. Um, so you would get this sort of work, which this was a hand-drawn map that was drawn in 1914 um, after the French and British armies mounted an attack on Marne against the Germans. Um, and this was done immediately after that attack ended. Um, and what this is actually showing is how they saved Paris from the Germans. And after this battle, there was a four-year stalemate on the Western Front. Um, and so you would get these sort of hand-drawn on whatever scrap paper they had with them sort of material. You would get the maps that were being printed by the printing offices from whichever um, country was sending the maps to these groups. Um, and then you would also get maps like this next one, if you can do the next slide. Um, might be hard to see, I apologize. It's actually the same map. Um, on this side is the full map. Um, next to that I've done a blown up so you can kind of see the detail where they've taken one map that was originally created that's just looking at kind of the topography and where roads and communities are, and then they've overlaid on it more information. And so you'd have these maps that were getting updated this way where they would just take that base map that didn't necessarily need to change and keep adding information to it as they gathered it. So this map is from February 10th of 1916. It's an artillery intelligence map, so it would not have been um, a widely held map. Um, and it is showing the uh, Vimy Ridge. And what it actually has in purple on this map, if you can make it out, are the British defenses. The Germans are in red. Um, and it's all of these interesting little triangle shapes are actually the artillery. Um, and it's labeled with what type of um, artillery it is and kind of giving that what is their range, what is their sight. Um, so this could be shared with knowing, um, updating where the Germans are, which guns to use when firing. Next slide. So this is another one where they have taken the topographic map and put more information on top of it. Um, this one's interesting because it highlights the importance of uh, that intelligence information in capturing maps from the other side. So this map is showing um, German positions in France, and all of this information was gathered from either maps captured for the Germans or from German prisoners. Um, and it, let's see, actually on the map says, information from captioned German maps, prisoner statements, and recent aeroplane photographs. It has where all of the artillery and machine guns are located. It also shows where all the trenches are for the Germans. Um, and this map is showing, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this correct at all, the Krimhild Stolgen, which was part of the larger Hindenburg line, um, which was a very vast set of trenches in northern France. Um, so. On this map, it also says, um, for the last two months, men have been working on these trenches, deepening them and building deep dugouts capable of housing 50 to 100 men each. And all of this information was gathered, either through aerial photography or capturing um, information from the Germans. So this is an American intelligence map. Um, it's also showing where the Germans are in France. I mean, this one's from October 7th, 1918. And what they've done on this map that can get kind of, again, hard to see is they have actually labeled what each of the German companies are and ranked them by their fighting skill. Um, so they go from a first class, which is the best, to a fourth class, which is kind of their lowest ranked. They've also divided them down by their division and regiment. But then what's most interesting on this is it also lists um, the duration of how long each of those regiments have been at their location. So then when this map would be given along to um, the American units in the field fighting, it would let them know which groups are most likely to be the most war weary because they've been there the longest. So it was the opportunity to find that weak point in the German front. Um, and so the other thing shown on this map is actually territory that was seized by the Americans in France from the attack on October 6th. 
So it gives you that, again, that, op that example of the immediate updating of maps overnight, because they capture the territory on the 6th, they produce the new map on the 7th. This is an image from 2013 in um, France um, showing the trenches as they look modern day and the scarring it's still left on our land. And that quote from that previous general about how they would build these trenches where you could put 50 to 100 men in these locations um, kind of gives you the idea of the, the impact it had during the war, but then also here is the impact it's left on our current landscapes. Next slide. So these are aerial photographs that were captured during the war. Um, this one here, we, I actually do have information um, for the date. This one was July 22nd, 1917. This section here, this large section, is all German trenches. Um, in the upper corner, though, is, uh, I think, French. No, British. I'm sorry. It's British trench work. And then you have the no man's land in between. This line going up and down the uh, image here would have been either a road or a railroad, or something that existed prior to the war starting. And you can see how it's actually just been taken over by the British trenches up top and the German trenches at the bottom. The one next to it, I don't have a date for, but what I found was really interesting is it was showing you how, as we were doing these flights, they would capture, this is actually the Germans being bombarded by the British, which is what these white posts of smoke, smoke are, are the artillery fire hitting the British trenches. Um, so the next one is a um, map of German trenches um, and their mortars. Yeah. Um, and again, the red's kind of hard to see. Um, this one's nice, though, because you can actually see their trench work is bisecting through these two communities at the top and bottom of the map um, and has completely taken out all of the road work between these two towns, which would have then cut off access of transportation of troops or goods between these two communities. Um, it also shows, which is what these little red dots are, where their mortars and artillery are, um, and the proximity of these to these communities, too, and the impact that would have had on these towns. And this one is from um, October of 1918. Next one. And a little bit on persuasive cartography or cartographic propaganda. Um, I find these very interesting. They're quite beautifully illustrated. Um, and every country in the war was producing their own work. Um, you're going to see some kind of central themes that unite them all. A lot of them are using imagery of an octopus with the tentacles reaching out across the continent, strangling or pulling in countries into the war. Um, this image here was a German, no, this one is depicting Germany. It's a French map from 1914, so it's at the beginning of the war. Um, this one's more on the art side than really being cartography, but it's this idea of um, striking fear on the German expansion idea of taking over Europe. Um, so in general, maps are often presented to us as truth and fact, and we get a map and we believe what's on it as being accurate, which is why persuasive cartography or cartographic propaganda can be so impactful, is we're used to viewing a map as, as kind of an authoritative resource that we can believe. So in reality, though, all maps are subjective. We can't put everything on a single map, so any map is going to have some form of bias, depending on who created it and what they chose to include or not include. Um, that could be done in a way to uh, misinform, or it could just because it's not important for what that map is. But so for the persuasive cartography is what it often gets referred to because propaganda has such a negative connotation tied to it. These were maps that were produced primarily to um, try to influence an opinion or belief. These weren't maps being produced by the soldiers or for the government. It was being produced for the general population to try to sway um, support for the war, um, to sway people into enlisting to fight in the war, to um, provide money and whatever goods they might have. Um, and so during the war, you know, here it's used to polarize the states. Um, this map here, this is a portion of a map that was a German map. Um, and it's looking at Britain as a spider instead of that octopus imagery um, as spinning its web over Europe. Um, and this map is kind of going on those imperial ambitions of Great Britain um, and their reach into Africa and the Middle East. The flags on the legs are the um, close allies to Great Britain. And it was this idea that the Germans were trying to say was that these other countries weren't necessarily wanting to be involved in this conflict. Great Britain's just dragging them into it. So this one again pulls in the octopus. Um, so this one's from 1917 and it was a French map. The title translates over to War is the National Industry of Prussia. Um, so this map was actually produced and given out at a conference in France that was against German propaganda. Um, and it was just illustrating this, again, this idea of the aggressive nature of reaching the tentacles out, we're going to conquer all of this land. Um, and everything in that red and the bulb a uh, black line was what Prussia had in the past already moved on to and expanded into since the 1800s. 
Um, so they're trying to instill that fear of look what they've already taken, look what they're going for. They're reaching into Italy and they're reaching into France. This one is another uh, persuasive cartography. This one was meant for children, which I thought was really interesting that we were pre uh, producing these maps targeted at children. Um, this was done with a comic strip that would have gone out to children, um, school children. And it illustrates a lot of the different countries as dogs fighting. So you get the British bulldog and the French poodle. Um, Germany is being represented by a Dutch hound um, whose nose has actually been caught in the bulldog's mouth. Um, and then you have Russia up in the top corner coming in on a steamroller. So this one gets into this idea that Russia is coming in to kind of try to take over also. Um, and you get a little bit pulled in um, with, we have kind of a minstrel character in France, um, our soldier air dropping in. Um, let's see, so this one's from 1914. It's called Hark, Hark, the Dogs Do Bark. Um, yeah. so this was a Russian piece. Um, I put this one following that previous one because of the steamroller. This map actually has on it um, a quote from Russia on their representation. So what this is showing is what Russia thinks at the end of the war, what the country boundaries should look like. And their quote is, Russia is a great sovereign country that is fighting for the restoration of rights, justice, peace, and the rule of law on the globe. It does not need someone else's property. It does not need other people's lands. So they're trying to reassure the allies that they are not trying to come in and take over this land. You know, these countries, Germany, are defeated. No, 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 we're not coming in as a steamroller. We're just trying to help you keep your independence and your sovereignty. Um, so it was a piece produced by Russia. It's all in Russian, but it wasn't necessarily meant for the Russian people. So this is a French map, um, and this was released shortly after the United States joined the war in 1917. And it was released uh, for the French people who by this time had suffered the most casualties in the war um, to reassure them that now that America has joined, this is going to be the turning point. Um, and so shortly after America joined, um, representatives from each of the Allied countries came to America to meet with the president. And when the French um, representative met with Wilson. Wilson actually closed their meeting with him with saying, we are brothers in the same cause, which is this quote up top, which became kind of this um, rallying phrase for France that was repeated quite often in their media. Um, and this map talks about all the resources that are going to be coming from America. It's just a 10-day journey. It will be here soon. You're going to get people. You're going to get food. We're going to get money and gold, um, ammunition for our guns. Um, and this bottom little box here has the quote, the richest country in the world, 110 million people, 14 times greater than France. So um, it was an interesting piece kind of bolstering about how great America was going to be in the war, but it actually wasn't produced by the Americans. So that's a French map. This is a French map, yeah. Um, and so it actually um, would have been produced with the intentions of being hung up in schools and in public gathering places. Um, so it was a very large wall-sized map um, that... Um, was kind of to be posted as a poster for that reassurance for the people in France. Um, yeah, they put the, the, the resources, that, and I can't, speak, I can't read all the words. Mm -hmm. I can see petrol over in the yeah. far southwest of California. Yeah, so they kind of labeled where it's going to be coming from. So you have corn here in our, our um, mid area of America, and um, in our, yeah, the bulls and. Um, I'm not sure. I know everything listed um, are, I have it actually, I typed it up because I pulled it from a translation. Um, so soldiers, ammunition, wheat, oil, machinery, cotton, ships, beef, corn, rice, gold, iron, silver, copper, and coal were the things that we're saying. This is going to come from America. It's only going to take 10 days to get here over the sea. And then this last slide is just a little bit about us and where you can find uh, the maps collection. It is fully open to the public to use. You are welcome to come in and um, ask to see anything. We do a lot of support for the community for genealogy work. Um, maps are a great resource when you're looking at genealogy of your family. The collection together, we have over 250,000 maps. It's one of the largest collections in the state of Texas. It is global coverage of Earth. So we have a little bit of everything for everywhere. 